Mr. Mohi, we have. Oh no, we do have a quorum. Uh, there we go. You'll vote. Councillor Dick is just he'll be back uh, in a few minutes, but we'll start without him. And we need a chief executive. Here we go. Here's one. <laughs> They're everywhere. They're everywhere around this place. Yeah. This one's a bit tardy though. If he hurried up, he'd be better. <laughs> Bloody chief executives, you know, ten minutes in the job. Bloody tardy behaviour. Right. <clears throat> right, we'll call the meeting back into uh, into order. And um, Dr. Pierce, have you got anything further to add on the uh, previous conversation? Uh, thanks, Chairman. Ju uh, just one. I did say that we were going to be. <coughs> excuse me. That we were going to be. Um, seeking uh, uh, extra conditions around the uh, macroinvertebrate community index, and we do intend to um, apply under section 127 for those uh, conditions to be added to the existing set of conditions. And um, just to avoid any possible doubt or speculation, um, we will be asking for those as additions. We will not be asking for anything else to be changed or removed. There's, there's no such no thing. Longer, in, there's, there's no such thing in Hawke's Bay, as I'm sure you're aware, um, <coughs> Councillor Barker. And you shouldn't a, shouldn't attempt to put words in other people's mouths. So, is there any f <laughs> any further questions around uh, the um, recommendation? I mean, we'll get to the recommendation shortly, but any, any further clarification sought on any of this discussion before we move into uptake? Um, I just have one for Mr Maxwell. Uh, point C, um, the, um, that the RWSS um, is not required to meet the DIM limit, that, that, so the farmers within that um, consent or understand that. So the other farmers... Um, are they required? So I'll draw on Matt if he's listening to, to help me out here, but my, my recollection of the board traversing the issue of point eight, <coughs> um, you know, they, they exercised their mind for quite a while and in, the, in the, the, the narrative that goes with the decision they were, were reasonably explicit that the farmers in the, in the farming community under the plan provisions are required to meet the LUC leaching rates. That's, that's their compliance test, if you like. And that actually <clears throat> getting to the point eight DIN is, if you like, HBRC's issue to deal with. It's effectively put, put it back to council to achieve the DIN in time, but the farmers, through the plan, must adhere to the land use leaching rate, uh, land use capability leaching rates in table 591D and, and re will either require to be at or below them to be permitted or if above to seek resource consent. <coughs> I heard Matt Wright, he said that no farm is directly related to the DIM, whether in the scheme or outside the scheme. And again, that was the point the board traversed is that the difficulty of connecting an in-stream water quality limit with an individual farm, hence not connecting the two directly but, but doing that uh, or, or setting out a path to achieve the DIN by requiring farmers to meet over time the LEC leaching rates. Have I got that correct, Matt? I'll just get Matt to perhaps give any context or comment if I put that wrong. Yes, the, the way in which the DIN is relevant in the rules is primarily through the, the trigger for requiring a resource consent. And it's the... Um, so. Uh, rule TT1 has one of the conditions, J, um, which was the subject of a lot of discussion, which does bring in this, um, this DIN limit. Um, and, and so if, uh, and under the wording of that rule, subject to a couple of exceptions, um, if the nitrogen leached from the land on a, um, a particular farm property or farming enterprise um, is demonstrated to be causing or contributing to any exceedance of those limits, um, then they would require a resource consent. So they are not 
they are not capped to that as a as a means of saying you cannot carry out your activity, it's more that they would then have to go and get a resource consent which would set um, whatever conditions the council determined were appropriate for that farm. So, so my, my understanding of that was that it was triggered if the din level was still above 0 0.8 in the, in the river that's closest by, is that, or the nearest monitoring point in the river, is that not correct? The din is, is measured in the river, that's how it's Yes, that's yeah, but, but an exceedance above 0 0.8 is what triggers this requirement for a consent. Uh, well, it's it's that's the um, that's what it ties back to is the point eight. Okay. No further questions on that. Or so I'll just raise the matter that I raised before, Chair, um, with regard to the communications that you've had with the. Uh, potential targets for RWSS water. Um, would you be happy to supply those communications to Matt just to have a look at? I'm not sure that that's entirely appropriate. Um, we have our own legal advice um, and you would be asking the directors of the company to um, subject themselves to um, some other party's scrutiny. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to give um, any right of approval, editing, amending, changing. Um, uh, so um, I'm not entirely sure what the what the point of this would be. The, the the point, Andy, is that I'm looking. I mean, I haven't seen the communications, and I haven't seen the advice you've received on any of them either. Um, and I'm looking for some assurance that there are not any represent misrepresentations <coughs> being made to the farming community that might come back to Michael. impact on us. You can in a second. Yeah. Um, so. You appoint directors as a council, you appoint directors to this company um, and I think you expect us to um, behave uh, within the law and to behave properly. Um, and any suggestion that you might need to have further oversight of whether we are or we aren't doing that, I, I su suggest, might be taken as offensive. And fine, be offended, but there are some slight differences in the interpretation, as I understand it. Um, of some of the things that we've discussed today, and I'm just looking as a as a responsible council, I'm looking for mis, for some assurances that um, you know that we're not exposing ourselves to any future liability through through the actions of our subsidiary. Chairman, did you want to say something here? Yeah, Excuse I do. Me, the actually, chief executive uh, have a comment on that because I, I think it was a very broad statement yeah, about look at communications. I mean. Yeah what date, what particular set, I mean, oh, what are we talking about here? I, I'm talking about uh, communications to farmers in regard to RWSS and, and signing up to the scheme and what the well, what their obligations are and let, so forth under let's the... Hear, let's hear, let's, 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 let's be very clear, uh, to the extent that we make comment on the regulatory framework, uh, then that, that is under, a legal review is undertaken of that and has been in every circumstance. So. That's that's the you know that's that's me as the CEO, ensuring I have a legal review of, of, of what we communicate to the extent that it may or may not interpret um, legal issues under the consents. So now, the, the, so, so the point is that, that we are following a proper process there, and there's been a number of communications of various steps along the way as this journey's evolved and it's various steps that say well. This is where the, where the state of the process is at, this is where the state of the uh, consents are at, all that sort of stuff. And we'll continue to do that. But the, but the underlying point is, is that we, enter into, we, we and they will enter into contractual obligation, ultimately, uh, and already have done so in, some, in many cases, that has that is, that is completely been reviewed by more than one RMA lawyer and been reviewed by commercial lawyers as well. Yeah, okay. Well, okay. I, I, well, that's fine. Look, I, I, I'm happy to take an assurance from HBRIC that they're actually getting ongoing advice on this. I, I actually had a, what's prompted this is I had a um, call from a farmer who who was um, who had actually made a decision not to sign up to RWSS, um, and in a conversation with another farmer who has signed up, he started talking about this overs and under stuff. That's why I asked you a question about it, um, and he was really concerned that the um, scheme was being used if he if he remained a, a low intensity farmer I suppose who was um, well under the, the, the din cap um, he was concerned that the farmers in the scheme would be taking up but 
But is, surely now, Councillor Bevan, you could yeah, go no, back got, to him yourself and, and well, put, no, put, him, and put him at ease. I was, ease. Really, I was yeah. really assured by your answer. Okay. Okay. It was good. Councillor Bevan, but let's be clear too in your terminology here. There is no farmer that is under a DIN cap. There is no such requirement. It's, that's, so even that's confused. What, what the requirement is in the regulatory sense and compliance sense for the RWSS farmers and yet to be applied presumably by consent processes for other farmers not in the RWSS is that they are compliant with their LUC leaching rates. That's, yes, yeah, so, okay, so they, but, but, but this, this is a complex area, the terminology is very mixed up and I'm concerned that the messages get really mangled too, so I just want to be really clear about that. Um, okay. I can just, if I could just add to that, um, uh, we have been extremely careful right throughout this whole process about what we have seen in public. We have resisted um, being baited by other people's comments. There have been many comments that have been made by other parties that are simply incorrect um, and we have not responded in public uh, to most of those. Um, so and we will continue to apply um, the sort of level of prudence and care and scrutiny um, by our legal advisers on all sides of this discussion uh, to ensure that what we say is accurate. Thank you. Well, we've established that. So let's move on now to uptake. All right. Thanks, uh, Chairman. So uh, moving on to um, uptake, it's reasonably self-explanatory. I've used just used largely the same format um, that I used in the last report to the council in terms of progress here. Uh, but I'll but I'll traverse it briefly. Um, countersigned uh, agreements um, are sitting now at 20 million cubic metres of water. In the contracting process, we have the further 62 agreements uh, representing just under 16 million cubic metres of water. And in negotiation and due diligence, uh, we have a further 22 million cubic metres of water. Uh, I do not expect, though, that all of that would be converted into signed contracts. So, um, broadly speaking, there's, there's, there's been reasonable progress, considering we've been dealing with a lot of ambiguity, as we've just discussed, uh, and uncertainty around consents. Um, clearly, Clearly, well, in our view, now that we have the consents granted for 35 years, um, and we're in, a, we're in a much more confident place around progressing that work, and we expect to see expect to see that reflected in progress can, going can forward. Can I just ask a question, yep. Andrew? Um, um, there's no breakdown here of the intended um, use of the <coughs> water yep. for dairy or for grapes or whatever. I'm quite interested to see how that's now tracking. If yeah, no, fine. Got that information? I'll have it, have it. Well, I don't have it at my fingertips, but. Um, in terms of absolutes, but I can give you a flavour. Um, so the land use pattern, uh, contracted water patterns flowing in a very similar manner to what we call the McFarland scenarios. Um, so dairy is running slightly under uh, the McFarland scenario, which is around about 30, a third. That's running slightly under. Red meat, mixed arable red meat, um, arable is by far and away the predominant. Um, but what I would signal is that uh, in the background, we've had a significant amount of external interest in moving into the footprint, and I expect that that's going to ramp up rapidly, uh, and that external interest will bring in quite some quite interesting land uses. For example, around small seeds um, will be a, potentially a big development, uh, and I'll expect some uh, rather more novel um, livestock practices as well, actually. So um, I may as well touch off on the dairy price forecast payout because there's been commentary around what that does or doesn't mean. Um, in, the, in, terms of the, in terms of the dairy development within the scheme footprint, it's predominantly existing landowners, uh, and that's exactly what we expected. Um, and those parties that are entering into contracts are looking way beyond this particular commodity cycle. They're entering a 35-year agreement, uh, and they're looking a long way beyond the various, <coughs> the various commodity cycles. They tend to be, I'll, I'll be upfront about it, they tend to be bigger enterprises with very strong balance sheets as well. So. Um, so that's a bit of comment on that, but yeah, happy to report that land use mix as we go forward. And what, what I'm absolutely sure of is we will see quite a diverse land use pattern there, actually. Um, so questions? just for clarity, so in, in future reports, can we yep. include yeah, it? Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Thank yep. you. Okay. Uh, the question. Yep. Um, I see we're still using the uh, <coughs> Uh, the 40 million cubic metres is a sort of a metaphor for what it is. <clears throat> We've had a discussion about this previously, and uh, uh, it's been accepted. I'm just wondering if it's still accepted that because of the practice of 
giving discounts for early sign-ups and the substitution of groundwater for <coughs> uh, uh, water on the scheme at a lesser price. The, the actual figure of 40 million, cubic, uh, 40 million cubic metres is actually larger. The behind the 40 million cubic metres is a set of equations which you know, works out what the break-even point is. Is that still the case? Yeah, that's that's still the case. And um, just to, just to reference the reason why I'm, I'm using that, but I've, I've, sure. I've asterisked it, is that's the, that's the published figure. You know, we clearly and we've signalled we expect that to be a larger number. Um, but but more importantly, probably for for the councillors, what we do as we flow through into other 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 material decisions around reaching conditions, we will re we will re forecast the financial model. Uh, that'll be done probably in the next probably in the next two months. And as a consequence of that, I, the board may well decide that it formally revises that number, actually. Um, but, it's, but it's got to go through a process to do that. Well, I just would say I, I would expect <coughs> you know, uh, the board to advise exactly what the number is. So no, clear on, and clear on that, because yep. as I understand, the 40 million is just sort of a metaphor to an easy descriptor of what we've got to achieve. You know? Oh, yeah, and, and I can tell you right now that um, consistent with the comms we're giving the farming community, we're saying that the number's going to be higher than 40 million cubic metres. Yeah. Yep. OK, so um, just a few other relevant stats. We have 415 properties in that, uh, uh, <coughs> what they are as farm management units, the specific titles. Uh, some are owned by, by one individual, you know, there may be a number of properties owned by one individual enterprise, but on balance there's 415. Um, what we have got running also is we've got an eye to the future. So potential, potential irrigable hectares assessed to date uh, across the footprint that we're looking at in those 415 properties is uh, just under 40,000 hectares. So that's, that forecast is running very close to where we expected it to be. Uh, and we expect the RWSS at full scale to be able to supply between 27 and 28,000 hectares based on current demand pattern and behaviour. Okay. Um, uh, just as a matter of interest, current hectares to irrigate in stage three, that's contracted uh, to six, is just over 10,000 hectares. Um, but I note here that if those parties who are effectively our primary customer base at this point, uh, irrigated all their irrigable hectares, then they would potentially take another 20 million cubic metres of water. Now, I don't expect either to see, to see them do that in the first instance, but what I am signalling is I do expect that we, there's a high likelihood with our existing customer base that that irrigable area will rise contractually in pretty short order. Okay. Question? Um, yep. <coughs> Two, uh, when you say 415, is that... Um, 415 farm titles, or is that the 415 uh, where there might be multiple titles aggregated into one unit? And yeah, it's the well, it's, it's, the, it's the latter. So it's titles, and then, for example, there's one farming enterprise that, you know, with the one large scale one that has seven. Sure. Okay. So, so, so you've counted so the seven, not the one? Sorry? You've counted the yeah, seven. Yeah, that's not the right, one. Because, okay. because what we're doing, and, and the logic for that is... I get that. Yeah, yeah. You get that? Uh, just okay. as long as you've got the right thing. Right. And the second okay. thing can I is add, that... Can I add just one thing, point of clarification to that, though? <clears throat> that um, those 415 properties are... There are about 320 decision makers or operators, if you like, yeah. that manage those. That's, um, that's, the, that's the count at present time. That's exactly right. Okay. My, my second question... Is of the areas that you're going to, you've got here to irrigate, I remember raising the issue before that if you've got, it's expensive to put the piping to <clears throat> into a particular zone, and if you had uh, just one or two people wanting to take water at the end of the zone, the cost of putting the infrastructure wouldn't justify uh, putting the water to them to, to irrigate. Uh, that there has to be, there has to be some sort of trade-off here. If you had just one person on the, right. right down the end of the. Uh, so, the, with that in mind, of these ones here that you've got the figures for that are okay, are you committed to supplying them, putting the infrastructure in, uh, regardless of who else ever takes it up? Well, ultimately, that's that's a test that we'll apply as we lay the construction, uh, we 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 lay the secondary distribution network over the landscape. So that's a test that that we, the investors and the H board, will test as to whether there are properties that fall in or fall out of that question. Now, I have, we, haven't, we haven't run that process yet, 
But to answer your question, in a process sense, what we're about to do, and you're sort of leaping forward into yeah. construction, is we have uh, we're already, right now, we have the construction contract reprice validation running. And as part of that, we're going to lay this uptake footprint over that process and ask exactly that question. Just as long as we haven't yep. lost sight of the question. No, no, absolutely And not. that will feed back into the number of uh, yep. cubic metres that's going to be effectively sold. Oh, it will do. It feeds and, back and into or, the condition precedent about that. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and or, and or uh, test as to whether the construction, the secondary distribution network is built in one go or it's built sequentially or whatever. All of that stuff's the, um, there to be decided. Okay. <coughs> Uh, just um, moving on, a um, little bit of publicity, I'll just note one down the back there, he's smiling at me. Um, managed to find six farmers who didn't want to take water for whatever reason. Uh, there's a few more of them than that actually. 23% um, of that FMI, FMI database is, is uh, are enterprises that, that are not taking water for a variety of reasons. Whether it's age and stage, whether it's their farm practice, whether it's their balance sheet, whether it's the scale of their property or whatever may be the case, or some of the opposition to the scheme, which is limited. Um, but that is, that is to be expected. That's exactly what our process is about. And the sooner that we identify parties who don't want to proceed, the better it is for us, because we concentrate on the customer base that does. So just make that point. Um, uh, now, I, I've also made the point that we, expect, we continue to see active interest from external parties, uh, and I expect that that uh, that, that, that interest will increase now that we're through the consent phase. Okay. Uh, just um, going on to design and construct Workstream, I've, I've touched on it, um, but the key point is, yes, we have, we have with constructors initiated the price revalidation as part of the way in which we contracted with them, uh, and we have, expect to have that complete in September, uh, and in turn, we ex also expect to have the construction contract completely completely dealt with by the end of September. Okay, right, financing, uh, which is probably my last point, I think, if I look at what I've written here. Um, financing, uh, as, of, uh, as of this week, we are now back into a, a very active process around investors. Uh, and uh, I would just note that um, we have investors who have done some work, uh, one investor who's done a lot of work, uh, and those con conversations are ramping up, and of course, one of one of the issues that they're working through, uh, lo and behold, is the consensus framework. So I spent two days this week on that subject with investors, uh, and the chairman did signal that that, that uh, uh, within reason we'd certainly like to by about October to be to be into a preferred investor scenario. So that's. Uh, it's probably the speak to report. The financial report. Uh, yep, um, Heath, I might get you to do it so it's, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, just looking at the tables on page forty-nine. Um, so, from an operating perspective, 